Welcome everyone to our Going the Distance with Video series. I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock, and I'm here. Um, I'm faculty mentor with CVC and At One, and I have the honor of hosting this session today with these wonderful individuals who have put so much time and effort into this presentation. So I just want to acknowledge that right off the bat. We've all we all know how much time it takes to do this, and I was just saying um, to the presenters as they are coming in. You know, you agree to do things and you think, oh, sure, I can do that. And then when it comes down to the wire, you're like, wow, this is a lot of work. So I, I want to really acknowledge all the work and creativity and willingness to share that goes into this session. We're here today for your own personal recording studio using the studio canvas, the studio tool in Canvas. And we're joined by Lene Whitley Putz, who's the Dean of Online Learning at Foothill College. And then we have Team Foothill here, which I think is really cool. Cynthia Braunval, who teaches art at Foothill, uh, Rosa Nguyen, who teaches chemistry, and Nicole Gray, who teaches math. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to pass the next slide over to Lene, and then Lene will kick things off with the rest of our presenters. Thanks, Michelle. Um, it's very exciting to be here. Um, kind of feels like old home week for me. Um, I'm just going to really quickly introduce uh, what it is that we're looking at. For those of you that are brand new to Studio or have not used Studio, it's been like the kind of tab on um, Canvas that you've been ignoring. Um, Studio is a tool that allows you to actually create video. So you can shoot your video and edit your video, but then it also allows you to host the video. So um, that's where your video actually lives. One way that people have um, hosted video in the past 10 years is on YouTube, but there's millions of videos there. But this actually takes your video, puts it into an educational setting so that there's no ads or any other things that are going to um, sidetrack your student. And then uh, the other pieces that it allows you to caption the video and create discussions and quizzes from your video. So it's really a comprehensive tool, a, a studio in a box as it is. So we're going to show you um, how three different faculty are using uh, the studio tool at Foothill. We're going to start with how to create a video using the studio tools, how to upload, embed, and caption a video that's recorded with Zoom, how to upload a video from an iPad and embed it and then create a quiz from it. And then I'll take you on a little spin of your studio library and hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Cynthia who will show you how she's using it. Hey, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Cynthia Branval, and I actually teach art history at Foothill College. I am also a practicing artist and exhibit, but my uh, the courses I teach are in art history. I also want to just start out by saying that I was a little surprised to be invited to this because I have only been making videos for the last couple of years. I started out with a lot of resistance to it um, just because it was so odd at first to um, see myself and record myself. Um, but uh, I guess I've risen to the <laughs> one of the highest users along with my co-panelists today. So how do I use Studio? I make welcome videos every single week on the homepage and my homepage changes throughout the course. So the first page of the module for the week, I designate as the homepage, selecting use as front page, and then I've selected that as my homepage. And it always has a welcome video from me that is usually you know three to five minutes. Um, and then I also include an overview of the week's content, objectives, the reading assignment, and a link to the office hours. For my welcome videos, I record them on QuickTime and upload them into Studio. I've started doing that recently because sometimes there can be glitches in Studio um, that I've experienced and so, and then haven't been able to resolve. So that's why I use QuickTime. And then I also have um, a number of recorded chunked five to 10 minute PowerPoint lectures for students uh, both in my hybrid and asynchronous classes. And that's what I'm gonna be 
showing you how I do that today. And then I also use the captioning in Studio. So the advantages of using Studio for me is that it easily embeds into Canvas. It has very good captioning technology. I do uh, sort of review and edit the uh, captioning that's done, but it's, it's pretty good. I also think, and this is probably the most important for me, is that it humanizes the online platform, particularly for asynchronous online classes. I think particularly my welcome videos um, give students a sense that I'm with them throughout the course. Um, and I often will have students come up to me on campus who've taken online classes with me and they have that familiarity. So I think it really does support building um, relationships with students. So some of the disadvantages of using Studio for weekly welcome videos specifically is that Studio can be glitchy. Um, I've had a number of incidents where it, for, for whatever reason, it's not recording the sound and no matter how I try to fix it, I can't seem to resolve that. Making weekly videos um, takes time. In my opinion, it's worth it, but it is extra work. And then um, a question that I have is, it, I'm not clear who owns the content that's created in Studio because it's sort of the college platform. So this is just an image of what my homepage would look like. So on the left, you can see, this is from uh, just this term week four from my Asian art history class. And so you can see I've replaced the thumbnail for the video, which is right here. And so students will press play and they'll get my welcome video. And then underneath it, I'll have my office hours with a link, an overview of the week and the reading assignment. And what you don't see in this is I also have the last three announcements that I've posted for the class. I include that on my weekly welcome videos. And so for creating a studio video lecture using PowerPoint, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today, I'm sort of going to give it to you in a variety of ways because as I set out to create this presentation, I realized that I couldn't, or I didn't know how to record myself creating this process in studio. So I've created uh, sort of these instructions for you to refer back to. These are sort of the steps. And then I'll show you some screenshots and then I'll show you a couple of uh, different videos um, ending. So the first thing I do is I open the PowerPoint lecture um, and another tab or window, I'll open studio, I click record and select screen capture because you'll get two options. Um, and then I'll select again the open screen recorder launch. I think it's screencast-o-matic that's embedded in this feature uh, when you choose screen capture. And then when the record window opens, I'll select both. You'll see what I mean when I show you the screenshots. Then I'll adjust and crop the window to the PowerPoint slide, hit record. And then during the countdown, I'll select either the large square, I'll show you what that looks like too, uh, that shows me, or I'll select the square with a smaller square inside of it that gives uh, the students a view of my PowerPoint slide and me um, in the small, in, a, in the corner. And then you can go back and forth between these. And then once you've finished uh, the lecture, you press pause and a window will open up with some options for you to uh, title the video, to write a description. You can even edit the video or you can redo it and then you upload it and it goes directly into Canvas. So here are some screenshots. It's a little bit confusing, but what you're looking at is my PowerPoint lecture and I've selected um, screen capture. The other option that you'll see is webcam. I use webcam for my welcome videos, but screen capture allows me to do both. And so here you can see, I wanna select both. It gives you the, the option to have the screen or the webcam and I select both and then you can see also it presents you with this sort of cropping square. And so what I'll do with that is I will adjust it to the slide. I really like this because I can 
see um, my notes if I have any so that I can be walking students through a lecture, but then I can also be sort of narrating or adding things that aren't on the slide. And then this bottom picture here, these are what those squares look like when you toggle back and forth. So once you hit record, um, you'll see this on the bottom of the screen and you can go back and forth showing your, you know, I can show myself taking up the whole window or I can select this one where the bigger part is the slide and the smaller part is me giving the lecture. So this is the first video that I made just showing you the selection process. I hope that this uh, will make it easier to understand those directions that I offered. I'm doing something a little new for myself, but I think I've got it here. So I'm gonna just press play, it's a short video. Hello everyone. In this first short video, I'm gonna show you the initial steps to take when making a video in studio using PowerPoint. I'm actually filming this through QuickTime just because I don't know how to do uh, this piece within um, studio. So I'm already inside of my Canvas shell for my college. I'm also inside of studio. If not, you would click on studio here in your tab at the left. And so to initiate this process, the first thing you would do is to click record. And this window opens up. When I'm making my welcome videos, I use the webcam capture option. But for PowerPoint videos, I'm going to select the screen capture. I'm going to select again, open screen recorder launcher. Sometimes it asks me to download the app. Again, I usually X out of that because I've already done so. But if you haven't already downloaded the app, then you want to um, do that in the beginning. The next step is to select both screens. And that enables you to be able to have um, the frame of your PowerPoint lecture and then also your face as part of the video that you're making. And I'll show you what that looks like in the next video, but you would select both. Okay, now I'm gonna show you that second video. Hello everyone, in this short video, I'm just gonna be going through some of the advantages and things that you can do when recording a PowerPoint lecture in studio. So I like to start often uh, with a full view of myself. So I'm using the webcam feature. So I've selected the box on the far left that I showed you in the slides. So that is the webcam feature and it allows me to sort of connect with students and say, welcome. Um, today we're gonna be learning about visual literacy. And then I'll select the middle box, which then moves me down to the bottom. And we can start to go through the PowerPoint, which I have framed so that the students are seeing the slide. And it allows me to simulate the classroom environment where students might see the slides all projected onto a screen in front of the room. And then I'm also engaging with them. Uh, I might add things that are in my notes. That's another feature of filming PowerPoint in studio that I like, that I can still see my notes. So I might say to students that um, what we're going to be learning today is going to be very helpful in writing about art, particularly for the weekly discussion lab writing assignments, and also the essay question on the midterm and final exam. And then from there, you can just go through your lecture. Um, you can see I'm moving myself. You have the ability to move that screen in real time. Um, I saw that it was intervening with the words. I will say often when I'm recording a PowerPoint lecture, I probably will go through sort of a dress rehearsal because I want it to be pretty polished so that I can import it um, in multiple terms. And so I often will have a script um, and then I kind of go through my PowerPoint, making sure that 
the text boxes or and images are configured in such a way that I'm not covering any words in the content. But you also have the option to take yourself um, out of screen. So if you want to have the students just focus, oops, sorry, that appeared. That happens when your daughter text messages you <laughs> and it's her computer. So, you know, these are, so I'm going to leave this in because these are the kinds of things that do come up when you're creating a PowerPoint lecture. And so you have to be um, aware of that. So um, I'm just moving through, but right, those little things, if you don't sort of do the pre-work of moving the images or the words or, uh, you know, turning off your phone or powering it off so that text messages don't pop up while you're recording, um, those are things that you learn as you as you go along. Uh, but I still think the benefit of having a recorded uh, lecture like this with PowerPoint that is sort of emphasizing the content that I want students to have, but they're also having that experience of um, familiarity with me. So you can go through your lecture, you can move things around in real time, you know, I'll just show you how you can do that. But ideally, I when I make them, I do try to have it be somewhat polished. I like the ability to toggle between the um, full screen and having me in the corner like this or having me out of the frame. Um, you know, I might talk about implied lines and then maybe I wanna give students a chance to see a bigger image of this. So I might move myself out of the screen and um, let them just focus completely on the image itself, I might talk about it and remind them as they're looking at it that hand gestures create implied lines. We tend to follow the gaze of those depicted in the art. Those create implied lines, reminding of them of those things that we've talked about so they can see it for themselves. I might give them a graphic after they've spent some time pointing out that these implied lines are creating this apex in the composition culminating in this one figure with dark skin as he waves kind of a red handkerchief. And I might ask them to spend some time looking at the painting, thinking about what is he waving that towards? And then I might, you know, come in again and, um, you know, be here and sort of point out that there's this tiny, tiny ship in the distance right, that we can see in the in the waves far in the background, um, pointed out to them again, move myself out of screen so that they can see it, or I've emphasized it in my PowerPoint, and um, talk about how um, the hopelessness of it, right, that this ship is um, so tiny, and that if we look at the image, the larger image, again, we can see that the storm is moving towards these tragic figures floating on this raft. The um, waves are moving away from them. That ship is, is just so minuscule in the painting, you can barely see it. So there isn't a lot of hope that they are going to be noticed. And then I might switch back when I'm done with the um, lecture and say, you know, I hope this has been valuable for you. Um, whatever I might want to end on, this is going to help tremendously. I look forward with your weekly discussion posts and I look forward to reading them. And that's it. Then I press pause and upload it to Canvas. Uh, yeah, upload it to Studio. Okay, everyone. Um, I'm hoping you can see me again. I've stopped sharing, but that is my... Uh, video. I do have a little another video that I could show um, my very first video that I made um, with the support of Lene and Paula on either side of me like protective sphinx. But I want to be mindful of the time because um, I know that we have two more amazing panelists. So I just want to say thank you for um, for having me here. And I will pass the uh, 
this presentation to our next presenter. Hi, everybody. So Cynthia, there's some people in the chat that wanted to watch that video, and I'm kind of curious too. Oh, okay. But All I'm right. happy I'll to give up some of my time. Let's so, watch a couple minutes of it. I think I'm still under the 20 minutes. So we'll just watch a couple minutes of it. So Cynthia, um, we could move to Rosa just in case. Yeah. Um, and then I have it ready to go as well. And I also have it in our resources. Okay, so, perfect. Yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing video. So we all want to see it, believe me. I don't know if it's amazing, but thank it's you. amazing. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Rosa Nguyen and I am a chemistry instructor here at Foothill and prior to um, COVID I was teaching my course as a asynchronous hybrid where my students would have um, the lecture content delivered online through Canvas and then the lab they would come in person to see me each week and so I've been teaching in this uh, format for a while, and I'm always learning new things. So I'm happy to share what I've learned with you today. So how do I use Studio? Like Cynthia, I have a welcome video each quarter. I don't record mine each week, but at the beginning of the quarter, I will um, record a video and kind of share a map of the campus and show my students where they need to park and all these things about, um, about starting school, you know, coming to my class. And then um, what I do is I have taken my lectures and try to transfer them into the online space by recording them asynchronously via Canvas. So when I teach my in-person classes, um, you'll see that I will upload a set of slides for my students and I use um, an application or an app called Notability to do that. And the students are presented with a set of slides I use the same set of slides. And then as I'm teaching in person, I will write on top of my slides using an Apple pencil. So what I was looking for was something as close to that as possible in the online space. And I do think I've found the way that, um, that works for me. So I record lectures and mini lectures. They are anywhere from 10 minutes to 15 minutes long. And then if we add up all of the lectures and mini lectures, it equates to a four hours of content per week, which is comparable to the four hours of lecture that my students would attend if they were coming face to face. But instead of like two Zoom recordings, each two hours long, they get, you know, many different videos that are about 10 to 15 minutes long. So I like to use Zoom to record my lectures and I upload it to Studio. So I use Studio mainly as a platform that um, helps me organize my videos and helps me caption my videos and embed it into Canvas for my students to see. They go through a weekly module and within each weekly module, there are weekly lectures. And then I also use Studio to look at the course analytics. So you students um, will you know, watch the video, some watch them once, some watch them more, multiple times. And I'm actually able to see which students are watching the video, how often are they watching the videos, or if there's a video that's 10 minutes long, I can see how many students make it from the beginning to the end of the video. So I get a good idea of um, what videos my students are engaging with and how they're engaging with it. So some advantages of Studio is that I was able to seamlessly embed videos into Canvas. It's very, very simple and straightforward. And I'm able to annotate the videos um, in the way that I like to annotate them in my face-to-face -face lecture. So using an iPad with a, a file of slides using my Apple Pencil, um, that's how I annotate my, you know, my slides, my lectures, and then Canvas will caption the videos for me. 
Canvas will allow me to organize my lectures using collections. So for example, I will um, organize them by weeks or I might organize them by chapters, but it allows me to go back um, quarter by quarter to see you know, how I've organized my content in a previous quarter, whether I need to reorganize it, you know, the following quarter. And then I you know, monitor my student progress using analytics. And then an advantage for my students is my students tell me they like to speed up, slow down, or rewatch video. So as it turns out, um, in my Zoom delivery, I actually talk a little bit slower than um, when I'm face to face. And so my students think that they will um, watch my videos at 1.5 speed to have it be the same speed that I talk when I see them for my in-person lab. So they kind of um, find a way that works for them. So some disadvantages of Studio is that I personally have not figured out how to use Studio with the Canvas app on an iPad. So we all have our Canvas teacher app and that allows us to um, you know, grade assignments or upload videos, but it is not possible for me to use the Studio app and record using Notability. And therefore that's not the method that I record my lectures. Um, if I am using the studio um, application through my desktop, I'm actually able to only record the screen. And I think Cynthia has done a really great job with her discipline, like showing the artwork and zooming in, but um, I wanted something that would be reflective of my in-person lecture. So I did, um, you know, when you record the screen on your, your desktop, we're not able to record the written annotations. Um, I've also, you know, tried a couple applications to make my videos. And I found that when I was making my videos using QuickTime, it takes a long time to upload. And so that was, you know, I would make a video that takes, you know, 10 minutes long, and then it takes 20 minutes to upload. And it was, um, I couldn't figure out why. And so my workaround was to use Zoom. And um, one thing that I actually really like about my Zoom workaround was kind of a like an accidental um, thing that I figured out because when I would record my screen before on QuickTime or even I'm using QuickTime to link it to my iPad, I could see that top toolbar where it shows like the date and the time and my students could see I was like recording a video at two in the morning, like eight months ago, right? And so for some reason, when we share screen on Zoom, that like top toolbar doesn't come up. So the videos, um, they don't show the date and the time or, you know, the weather of when I was recording my video. So that's something that I really like about Zoom. However, another disadvantage is, um, when my students are using their Canvas app, either on their phones or on their iPad, students are required to launch an external tool using um, the Canvas app. So on the desktop, the videos are embedded and you can see the thumbnails of each of my video lectures, but it is not as um, beautiful, I guess. It, it, it looks very different and I wish I had a screenshot of that, but um, it says launch external tool, which is, you know, one more step for, for the students to, um, to do, to take when they, um, when they watch the videos. I'm really sorry. I actually like teach with my chat on, so I'm monitoring the chat. And so I'm going to answer that question. So how do you get your Zoom to look so sharp in the foreground? And oh, Lene is going to answer that for you, Ellen. So um, I don't do anything. I just have like the setting on the background. So there's nothing I do on my own to do that. Hopefully, Lene will have an answer for you. Okay, so there's definitely some disadvantages to Studio. I do think the, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages, and I've been able to find workarounds with um, the disadvantages that I've, I've noticed. Okay, 
So, so how do I record my lectures via Zoom? So the first thing I do is I start my Zoom meeting and um, in Zoom, you can turn off your microphone or turn off your video. Um, and what I like to do is I turn off my video because I don't, I'm not comfortable with my face in the, um, the Zoom recording. And so I will always deliver my lectures with the video off. And then I will start recording, right? We all know that like your video is being recorded, right? That button. And then my video is being recorded via Zoom with the video off. And then I will screen record on Mac or I will screen share the iPad. So um, when you screen record on the Mac, right? You can see your desktop. You could probably go through slides, but you're not able to annotate on your own screen. If I share screen to iPad, I'm able to open up my application notability, and then I'm able to write my lecture, or I'm sorry, start delivering my lectures with my Apple Pencil and um, have it be recorded via Zoom. So a few tips of if you go about it that way is you want to make sure that your wireless network is the same um, with your Zoom and your iPad. So uh, it I, I will tell you, you know, those of you at Foothill, it does not work on our college Wi-Fi. This doesn't work. It only works at home for me. Or if you change, you know, the Wi-Fi to the same network, that only that's the only way I've been able to get it to work. And then I just record my lecture until the recording is completed. And then I go into Zoom again and I download the Zoom recording to my Mac where I then upload it to Canvas. So I have um, a video here that I'd like to share with you. And this is just a Zoom recording with the video on and you are looking at my desktop. So this is not through the iPad with Notability. This is through my Mac um, using QuickTime. And so this is typically what I'll do for a welcome video. So let me share this video. to the Canvas page. So this is the home page for our section. Okay, so that was really quick because I didn't want to go through my entire welcome video, but you'll see that the difference between having the video on and off is, you know, when the video is on, you see like my little face on the corner. Um, and then you are able to go through your um, your Canvas shell or whatever your slides on on your desktop. To oops, the Canvas. Nope. Okay. So here I'm going to share a second video of my iPad recording. So this is um, a very small bit of my lecture that I will give for my students. And so I'm gonna just share this. This two is called a coefficient. So let's see if I can highlight that. A coefficient means I've got one, two, oxygen molecules and the O2, this is gonna be O, 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 or O2, or O2. Rosa, you're still o sharing your PowerPoint two. instead of the video. Do you mm -hmm. wanna share that video? Subscript. Indicate the oh, no. what am number I of. Sorry, it was I was sharing my PowerPoint and I was not sharing my video. Correct. Okay, let me try that again, Lene. Thank you for letting. Uh, did the first video get shared? Um, I 
think it was the still shot. The, on, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's um, let's let me try to share it again. So so let's see. Quick time share. Choose this two is called a coefficient. So let's see if I can highlight that. A coefficient means I've got one. For some reason, we can't see it. It's just dark. Molecule. Yeah, still not showing. Um, okay. Let me, would you like me to share it? Um, I can try to um, play from my slide show. Do you mind if I try one more time? Try, no, yeah, try that. Definitely. Okay. So here we are. Choose. This two is called a coefficient. So let's see if I can highlight that. A coefficient means I've got one, two oxygen molecules, and the O2, this is going to be O, 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 or O2 or O2. So the two here, this subscript, indicate the number of oxygen in the molecule. OK, so. Um, that video goes on for a while, but I think the big take home message was one, my face is not in the video. And then two, the time and the date is not in the video. And then three, um, you can hear me or students will be able to hear me talk and they will see me write as I'm going through my, my PowerPoint or my slides. And so um, that's the way that I like to lecture um, face to face. And that's um, why I deliver my lectures in this way um, asynchronously as well. Okay, so let me do. So um, just to go through those steps again, so this is the Zoom interface and under recordings, there is a way to download. So once your lecture is over or you've stopped sharing or stopped recording after some time, your lecture or your meeting gets um, recorded and then uh, sent via Zoom, you get an email letting you know. So I just download the video recording and then I take that video and I upload it via Canvas. So I'll open Studio in Canvas and then I'll upload the lecture using the Studio Collection. I'll change the thumbnail, but uh, my colleague Nicole will show you how to do that. Um, I will open my captions, manage captions, request caption, select English and review and publish captions. So this is um, what I do every time I upload the video, I will go through these same steps. So I'm going to play this video of me uh, demonstrating those steps. Hello, I'm going to show you how you can upload your video to Canvas and embed it into a Canvas page. So I'm going to share my page with you. And from my Canvas dashboard, I'm going to go to Studio, where I can start a new collection. And I'm going to call that Demo add video and I'm going to go into my desktop and then upload my demo video and what will happen is you'll see that it's uploading I'm hoping it goes by fast because then you'll have a demo and if you like you can replace thumbnail and change it into another um, thumbnail. But what I wanna do is I wanna show you how you can have captions on your video. 
So you'll click on the video, captions, English, and then request. And so the video is quite short, so I'm hoping the captions come up soon. But while we wait for the captions, what I will do is I will open up another Canvas page. And maybe I will go to a course. Um, I'll go to my development course. I can't quite find my own development course. Oh, here we are, Practice Nguyen. And so I will go to Pages. I'm sorry, Modules. Let's uh, just create a page. So I will just click Create a Page, Page, Create Page, and then we'll say, Demo Canvas Studio. And then from this page, I can embed the video that I just uploaded. So if I go to Studio, I'll see that I'm still waiting on the captions. So this is my library and I have them grouped, my demo video. captions, review and publish, and then you can publish your captions. So once you have this video here with captions, you can go to your page and then you can embed the video. So this is a demo video for a studio. And then to embed the video, you'll go to the icon here. This will take you to studio. And you can click on the demo video, select, embed, and then save. So when students or when you, you know, visit this page in the modules, right? So I'll just quickly publish that. We'll go to Demo Canvas Studio. You can play the video that's embedded in your Canvas shell in your module. So one thing that my students like to do is they will change the speed of the video because I tend to talk slower in my videos than I do in my in-person class. So students will oftentimes speed up my video if they like, okay? So that is how you take a video, upload it into Studio, into your library, and then go into Canvas and embed your video into a page. And also we talked about um, captioning the videos. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so um, this is not a great screenshot, but I just wanted to show you, oops, I apologize about that, what um, the students might see. Um, so in my lectures, there is a page that represents a two hour lecture. And there are, you know, anywhere between 10 and 15 videos. And then they just get uploaded one after another sequentially. At the bottom of the page, I will include a copy of the slides. And I will also include a copy of my annotations because um, my students will always ask for, for my notes as well. And so that's provided for students so they can follow along while they're watching the videos. I just also wanted to show you a bit about the analytics. So when you access your video through the library and you go under insights, 
you can click on insight and you can click on you know the section of class that you want to look at or all students or all instructors and it will show you how many views and then the total time viewed and the, the number of unique viewers so unfortunately i've got 64 students but only 27 of them watch this video so um that makes me sad but that's what it, the analytics show you <laughs> also you can see the analytics the number of unique viewers, the number of times a video has been played, and then how long the video is played for. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop share, but I'm still here. And I just wanted to like, before I pass it off to my, my friend, Nicole, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, when you see us do our things and we all do things very differently, I think there is a way if you want to do something that is as comparable to something you're comfortable with in person, I do think there's ways to go about that. And so you shouldn't have to feel like you got to do something I do or Cynthia or Nicole does. I mean, there are ways I can help you. We can we can work together to sort of, um, you know, to, to think about how you're teaching um, in person and how that might translate online. Okay. I'm dead. Hi, I'm Nicole, and I'm going to share my PowerPoint slide here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how I use uh, Studio, particularly how I record things on an iPad and bring them. But actually, the bulk of the use that I use Studio for is the webcam capture that Cynthia showed us. And I use that um, to give feedback to my students. So my students do group work, they make a short video for me. And then based on their video, I, I give them some comments. But um, those are much more sort of almost like a discussion with the students when I'm presenting content or answering questions. I like to do that on an iPad. And like Rosa was saying, I was looking for a way to do this that was sort of the closest that I could come to representing how I'd want to do things in the classroom. Um, so why do I use an iPad? Um, because I have an iPad and Apple Pencil and it allows me to be able to write really clearly and explain and show mathematical notation in a way that's hard to do with a mouse on the computer if I were using um, Screencast-O-Matic. Um, I can upload those videos directly into Canvas um, using the Canvas app, teacher app um, on my iPad. The video quality is good. The sound is good. Um, and the other advantage of it is if you have other apps that you want your students to use, like calculator apps, you can show them how to use those right in the video quite seamlessly. Um, so the first thing you're going to have to do if you want to use an iPad to do this recording is to set up screen recording. And in order to do that, um, you would need to add it to your control center, which I'll show you how to do that um, on the next slide. And then you need an app for presenting. So um, Notability was talked about. Evernote is another one. Google Jamboard is a, available on the web and you could use that. It's like a whiteboard um, kind of environment. Uh, OneNote is the Note Microsoft um, product that uh, some people, lots of people have access to along with Microsoft products um, through their campuses. And I happen to use GoodNotes. That's the one. I have a daughter who started college in uh, fall of 2020 and that she researched to figure out how she was going to do things online. And she decided she wanted good notes and sh showed it to me. And so that's the one that I use um, for doing this. Uh, so how do you get to be able to record um, to start the screen recording? Well, for me, the easiest way to do that is to have the screen recording available in my control center on my iPad. So if you go into controls, um, you can click on control center and it's not up here in the things that are already included, but you can see uh, screen recording is down here. And if it is, you can just click the plus sign and it'll add it up to up there to the things that will be included in your um, in your screen 
control center. Oops, I think I went too many slides at once. Uh, and then how do you start a recording? Um, to get the control center to come up, you go up to with your finger to the upper right hand corner and you sort of swipe down into the left and it brings up your um, control panel. And this icon right here is the one for recording. So if you click on that, um, it then brings up uh, an interface like this one. I don't know how the microphone turns itself on and off, but I always check to make sure that it's turned on. It's usually off. And then after you get your microphone turned on, um, you can then start your recording. Um, and after your recording has started, there'll be a new icon that appears in the upper right hand corner that's sort of blinking red with that record dot in it. And then after that, you just go to whatever app you want to use. Um, I always set this up ahead of time um, and put a screenshot of the problem in. Uh, a lot of these notes apps are really good because they have a, um, a feature where you can have sort of a uh, like a laser pointer that goes along. So as I read things on the screen and you can kind of see here in this screenshot, the laser pointer is active there. I can underline the things on the screen and, and bring students attention to them. Um, and you know you could type in text if you wanted. You can highlight things. You can write. There's if you wanted to do shapes, you have that. This also has the ability to have the background that's um, like graph paper. If I had something I wanted to graph, so there's a lot of features you can use here. And I just wanted to show um, that when you're recording on your iPad, uh, you do have that information. You can see that I recorded this on Friday. February 3rd, and you can see the timestamp on it as well. And that's the information that Rosa was saying that she is happy to not have be on her videos um, when she records them in Zoom. So all of that information is there. So my students can tell when my videos likely came from another quarter, but they don't seem to mind that very much. Um, and you can see the record icon is still going here. It's a little bit easier to see here on this screenshot than it was on the previous one because of the different background. Um, some of the recording tips for using iPad, uh, you can get these silicon tips to cover the top of the iPad the Apple Pencil so that you don't have as many clicks sounding on the screen as you record because those can be loud because they're close to the microphone. Um, setting up the app ahead of time with all of the um, screenshots that you want so that you can move smoothly through is very helpful. Um, holding the iPad in the landscape position is very useful because if you have it in the portrait position, what Studio does is it puts in black um, on the sides of it to make it the regular dimension of uh, videos. And then if your students are viewing it on a phone, the screen, the size of the video can be very small. So landscape position works a little bit better with Studio than um, portrait does. Um, and then one of the mistakes that was really hard for me at the beginning, but I've got become really comfortable with is it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, a lot of my students tell me that they love that I make mistakes because it makes them feel like it's okay to make mistakes. Studio has the ability for you to be able to annotate things as well. So if there's mistakes that you really don't want out there that you want to correct, you can um, use the annotate fixture, fix, uh, feature of studio in order to be able to say what I should have said is blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's okay to make mistakes and it makes the filming process go quite a bit more quickly if you um, leave those in. Um, ending your recording, I you in order to do that, you're going to click on uh, the record button here and it brings up an interface like this one. You can also pause this way. Uh, so if you just wanted to pause and think for a second and don't want that to be recorded, you could click there and then click cancel and it'll pick up the recording right where you, right at the time when you um, clicked on the record button up here. Um, if you're ready to stop the recording, you hit right here and stop it. And then it saves it to as a video in your photos app on your iPad. Um, then we're going to get that uploaded into Canvas. So in order to do that, we need to have our teacher app. We click on our teacher app and that uh, brings up the 
uh, app interface. Up in the upper left-hand corner is the menu, clicking on that menu. Um, one of the options there is studio. And you can see the studio interface here is very much like the studio interface that you see when you're on a laptop or a desktop. And you're gonna click here to add your video. And it brings up a very similar inter interface, but clicking on browse files um, gives you different options because you're on an iPad, you would click on your photo library and the most recent videos would be in the upper left and you click on those and you get a check mark on, and you can actually upload more than one video at once if you want to. So just put check marks on all of them that you wanna upload and then click on add, and you'll be able to see how many files we're uploading and what the progress is on those as they upload into Canvas. Um, then one of the things that I like to do a lot is to replace my thumbnails and, um, some of that is because it just takes a random slide from anywhere in the video to use as a thumbnail. And sometimes those don't really help students. So I sometimes name mine with like, this was a unit 2.2 preparation problem, question three. Um, and you can see I used, uh, went back to uh, Good Notes and typed that in using uh, the ability to type. And um, then I did a screenshot. You can do a screenshot on your iPad by pushing the home button, which is the round button at the bottom and the power button at the same time. And in this case, I click on that very quickly and that allows me to crop that so that I don't have um, the other information there. So I'll bring um, this down a bit and then I'll only have the white background uh, with the text there that I put in. And then I go back to the Canvas app, I click on the three dot menu, uh, click on replace the thumbnail, click on the photo library because that's where the screenshot got saved, select the video or select the photo that I want to use as my thumbnail. And it asked me if this is really the one I want to use. And then I can click on use. And now you can see that the video now has a different look than it did. It has the thumbnail that I chose uh, rather than the one that uh, that studio had automatically chosen for it. And why might you want to replace thumbnails? <laughs> because uh, when it randomly chooses a picture for you, sometimes you have a very funny look expression or a blurred hand or whatever. Um, and instead, you can take a nice picture smiling at the camera that you can use as your thumbnail instead. Um, another reason is you can use them to sort of label the videos for your students as well. So on the assignment pages where I have more of my sort of short lecture videos, I have the name of the course and my daughter actually made this background for me that I can type in a description of what each video is. And it kind of gives your course a certain um, sort of look to it. And you could use different types of thumbnails for different things. So students know what to expect just by seeing the thumbnails for those. Um, I usually add my videos to my Canvas pages using embed code rather than using the um, editor to do that. And the reason that I do that is uh, something that Rosa referred to, which is if your students are accessing Canvas through the phone app or through um, an app on a tablet, when those videos are embedded using um, the studio embed button, which I actually don't see right here, but usually it comes up here. It's probably in the three dots menu. When you embed them that way, uh, the students see external tool on the pages in Canvas on the app or on the phone. Um, and to avoid that, if you use the embed code, HTML embed code instead, they'll actually see the embedded video, but you, you lose the ability to see the analytics that Rosa showed you. So um, it's a give and take thing here. So how do you embed the videos? You go to studio, and you look for the three dot, you find the video that you want to embed, you look for the three dot uh, menu, and it brings up the same menu when you click on there, 
And one of them is to share media. So you click on share media. Um, you can always share it directly with people in your organization, but you can also create links. So when you click on create links, um, you have the option then to create public links. You click on create public links and there's a web link. This one you can send out to students and they can just use it, um, put it into a web browser. Um, and then the embed code is the HTML that you can use to embed it into a Canvas page. Um, you go back to the page or the assignment where you want to include the video. This icon down here toggles between this traditional text editor and an HTML code editor. And when we click on that, we our environment changes and the lines will get numbered along the side and you lose those editing tools at the top. You paste in that embed code and then you click back here and you can see how that video looks on that page um, and it has it embedded there um, for you. Um, and then lastly, one of the really cool things about um, Studio is the ability to turn any video into a quiz. And you do this by locating the video that you want to turn into a quiz, clicking on that three dot menu again, and creating a quiz. And actually, each video could become multiple quizzes depending on um, what you want to emphasize in that particular video. So you have the option to create multiple quizzes based on a video. So you click on create quiz. It brings up an interface that allows you to type in your title and a description. Um, you also have some choices here. Hide the question markers on the timeline. Um, if you leave it like this, the, quest, the students, when they look at the timeline, will be able to see exactly where the questions are. And theoretically, they could just fast forward to those questions and answer them. If you want them to not know where those are and be sort of forced into watching the full video, um, then you could click to turn that green. And then if you've added any in annotations to your video, um, those are allowed. Uh, the students will see those unless you click this and then they um, would not see them. I think that's the way that one goes. That one's actually a new feature. Um, then in your timeline, it was hard because this was made in a video, so it was hard to capture this bottom here. As you watch your video, when you get to a place in your video that you'd like to ask a question, um, you can click on a plus sign that comes up on the sort of the bar that shows you your progress through the video. And you have three different types of questions that you can ask, a multiple choice, a true, false, or a multiple answer. Um, the multiple answer one, you can type in your question, and then you can type in as many answers as you want, clicking here to add different answers. And these are check boxes, which means you're allowed to click more than one of those. You need to click the ones that represent the correct answer. Then you have an option to either leave the order that you type them as the order students see them or shuffle them randomly for students. And then you can also type in some feedback for students based on the answers that they enter. Um, true false questions. You type in your question, you select true or false. And again, you have that option for feedback. And then the last one is multiple choice. Here you can see we've got radio buttons. So only one of those can be selected. You type in your question, type in the different choices that you want available for your students. Um, again, the ability to shuffle your answers. You can also vary points by answer. So um, maybe you have an answer in there that's kind of half right. And so you could give your students half credit for that answer. And again, the ability to give students feedback based on the questions. Um, the feedback choices that you have in all of these uh, are for a correct answer. You could say something like good job for an incorrect answer. You could give them some more feedback about things to think about, or you could just provide general feedback on the question, regardless of what answer uh, the students give. And that is the end of my slide. So I'll stop my share and I'll pass this back to Lene. You have one question that you specifically oh. have to answer, which is have you used AirPods or something similar 
as a microphone to help you record um, when you're using your iPad. I actually don't use, I just go to a quiet room in my house and just talk without um, using I, any sort of a microphone. And I still get pretty good sound quality that way. Thank you. Okay, so um, we just took you through how three different instructors are using Studio. And I will say, um, we've crammed your head with a whole bunch of ideas because normally we do this over many different um, 60 and 90 minute um, webinars at our campus. And so one of the things that we've done for you is um, created a little Canvas course with some resources in it. And we've made that public. So I will go ahead and drop it into the chat. I think I just closed my chat accidentally. Um, and you should have access to that. And then what you're gonna find in there is a, a bunch of tutorials on how to do specific things. And then um, a little tiny bit of theoretical background for why you want might want to use um, the video in your course and then some examples to show you how we've used it in different ways. So there's an example, or there's two examples actually, of just using it as a presentation. There's one of using the interactive tools within Studio to have a discussion or commenting. Um, there's some examples of using it uh, as um, a quiz, an example of using it as students submit via Studio, and then we've got a little bit about closed captioning right there. We also have um, the Canvas Studio Guides all put together here, um, the PowerPoint archives from our presenters. And then I wanted to show you, we have Screencast-O-Matic Guides and let me show you why. So I'm gonna go ahead and just open up um, my studio library. And what you're gonna see when you open up your library, if you haven't any studio videos, it's gonna be empty. But if you do have videos, they're going to be in these tiles here. And um, I have a lot of videos. I have pages and pages of videos. So it can get really messy really fast. So the first thing that I want to tell you about is a thing called a collection. You can um, start a new collection. And what it will do is put all of those videos that you think are part of that collection together in one tile. So for instance, right here, we do something called the Tuesday tips. We put all of our Tuesday tips together onto one tile so that we don't have to look through hundreds of videos in order to find them. Um, so explore your library and figure out how you can get around in your library. There's a hamburger menu or a more menu right here. If you open that up, what you'll see is that's in the upper left-hand side is all of the courses that you have that have video attached to them. And um, so that's another way that you can filter out your videos when you get a lot of them. And you can also look at the videos that have been shared with you um, by one of your colleagues. So let's look at how we do a couple of these things. First and foremost, um, go ahead, close, okay. Uh, one of the reasons why we used screenshots and videos to show you how to use Studio is that Studio takes a lot of your computer's power in order to work. So we really suggest that you close everything on your computer except for what you're actually going to be working with as you create your video and your, your Studio dashboard. And to create a new video, so you're going to record a video. You're gonna start here at this record button in the upper right-hand side. And I wanna point out that you have a choice between screen capture and webcam. The webcam feature is really buggy. It's the old webcam that was part of Canvas before they had Studio. And um, I really recommend that you not use it at all. The other piece is screen capture. And screen capture is gonna allow you to record a, a video using a tool called Screencast-O-Matic. Sometimes when people are using Screencast-O-Matic that they launch from screen capture, it can be a little buggy for them. So I want to show you that you can go over to screencast-o-matic.com 
and you can set up a free account and then you will have the software on your computer and you can just create a video without even launching studio yet. You're still gonna upload it to studio eventually, but you're gonna be able to do it outside of studio. So you won't have your Chrome browser running or whatever browser you're using. And um, that might be a, a better option for people that are having trouble getting Studio to launch. So the free Screencast-O-Matic account is amazing, but also if you were to get a professional Screencast-O-Matic account, which is even better, it's only like $15 a year. So it's like the best $15 I ever spent when I first started teaching online. Um, and then the other really wonderful thing that they have is amazing tutorials because not only can you learn how to record, you can learn how to edit and annotate your videos so that your videos look really, really professional. And one reason why it's um, you hear people saying that they're using QuickTime or that they're using Zoom or that they're using something else is that learning how to edit is is a, a task, right? But Screencast-O-Matic makes it really, really easy and their tutorials are amazing. So I really strongly suggest that you um, archive that uh, link that I sent you, or you can go to the course um, that I sent you and you'll ha have a link to some of the Screencast-O-Matic tutorials as well. Um, really, really good video, easy to use video editing software. Okay, so after you've created your video and you've edited it, if you're working in your studio desktop, you have to do this in one shot. You have to record your video and edit your video and upload it in one sitting. If you're using your desktop version, you can go back and edit as many times as you want before you upload it to studio. To upload a video, you would just choose the add button instead of the record button. It's gonna give you this option. You can browse your files. You can even grab something from YouTube or Vimeo. Be careful about what you choose though, because you want a really good, you wanna choose a really good video, okay? After you've uploaded, it's going to look like this. And this is where you can go and do the captioning that, um, that Rosa mentioned. Here's your captions and you can request them. I've already requested them here. Some of the um, questions in the Q&A have talked about the accuracy. Well, the accuracy all depends upon your microphone, how quickly you're speaking, and how well you're enunciating. But no matter what, even like the most clear speakers are still going to have errors in their captions because a machine is just not gonna do it as well as a human would. So I always go through my captions and correct any of the errors that I see. Things like capitalizing canvas or um, fixing the punctuation, because if you pause, the AI is gonna think it's a period. It's gonna put a period in the middle of your sentence. So just go through, you just click on a cell in order um, to change it, and then you would publish those captions. After you publish the captions, if you find that there are still errors, you can always go back. Okay, so here we are, we're in this course here, and I wanna put this example of Cynthia's amazing lecture. Um, I hope you like it too, but one of the most amazing things about it is that it was the first one that she ever did. And she was just playing with the tool, but we were in the room with her and we could literally see the ideas coming forward in um, a cloud around her, a cloud of creativity around her. So that's why it's especially exciting for us. Um, but if you were going to embed this in a Canvas page, you would just go to edit the page, and then um, using all of the best advice from the CVC OEI rubric, you'd write really good instructions for your students about what you want them to do with that video. You might even have a list of questions for them to think about as they're watching the video. You can pretend that I've already done that and wrote those really good instructions. One of the things that Nicole mentioned is that she uses the embed code. She selects this button right here. I'm gonna show you how to do it through the Canvas Studio because that's how you get analytics. So when I do that, all of my studio videos are gonna come up, 
I can filter them a couple of different ways, but here's that video from Cynthia. And I'm just gonna select the video. It's gonna ask me if I want to have comments below it. I'm gonna leave the comments off and I'm going to embed the video. It's as easy as that. I'm gonna save and publish. And now in that course that we shared with you, you now have the video that Cynthia um, made and you can go back and view it. I want to um, encourage um, the other presenters to come on and I'm gonna read a couple of these questions that have come up. Um, one of them was from Rebecca. She said, have you ever made changes in what you do in your recordings based on feedback you get from your students um, when they see, when you see which videos the students are engaging with? And so I'll uh, toss that over to Rosa and Cynthia and Nicole. I don't know, do students ever give you feedback that makes you change the way that you do your videos? Um, they don't really provide feedback that changes the way I do the videos, but sometimes um, I'll get follow-up questions about a particular problem or a particular equation, and then um, I will make additional videos for the following quarter. So um, the way that I record and the way that I delivered a lecture, that, that doesn't change from quarter to quarter. That's a good question. Um, students are funny that way. They, they notice odd things like my cat in the background, um, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. So I haven't gotten feedback uh, from students, but I have gotten, I've gotten positive responses, I would say from students and also from my tenure team, um, when my, I've had classes observed and they really, um, a lot of positive response to those um, recorded lectures. So it, it makes me want to make more of them. I have them kind of peppered in the classes that I teach. And so I think um, that feedback has made me want to keep creating more and, and putting them in all of my classes. Yeah, I think the one thing that I did change um, in some of the feedback videos I do for my students, which are largely me with the background you see right now, I have this little tiny easel um, that I, my kids used when they were younger that had a whiteboard on it. And they're like, sometimes when you talk about numbers, it would be good to see them. So if I'm going to do something that's number intensive, I'll just pull in the easel behind me and have this really low tech solution Um that still allows it to feel more like a conversation, like I'm talking to my students um, that I've used from time to time. But I'd say that's, in terms of feedback from my students, that's the only real change I've made in terms of how I make my videos. So for those of you that are just starting out and a little nervous, um, after years of making instructional videos, I'll say that students are usually I mean, 99% super receptive and give you good feedback. They'll tell you how much they like them. And as Cynthia noted, it makes you wanna make more of them. Um, one question, I'm, we'll get to it along the line here, but um, as long as we're talking about it, um, do you use this for feedback or do you use this for lectures? And I think the answer is both, but I'm gonna lob that over to our panelists as well. So I use it for both. Um, when I'm doing lecture videos or answering really specific questions um, that need me to write out math notation, I use the iPad, but my students work in groups. And then at the end of the group work, they're supposed to make a short video where they discuss some key points of the group work that they did, things they struggled with, things they discovered, and then maybe another couple other pointed questions. And to respond to their videos, I make videos for them as feedback. So um, I definitely use it in both ways. Currently, I use it um, for my welcome videos and for um, recorded lectures. But um, like I said, I've only been doing this for two years, and I'm looking forward to acquiring the skills to empower students to interact through video, especially as we have Gen Z in the class. I think they are really comfortable with technology. So 
um, my, I have ideas <laughs> that I haven't acquired the uh, skills yet to incorporate, but I imagine giving students the opportunity to present their research, to have, um, you know, just kind of interface um, with each other and in the class. I feel like um, Rosa and Nicole are next level. Um, so they, so I'm looking forward to <laughs> growing my skills. Um, I primarily use uh, Canvas or Studio to record like lecture videos, but I've noticed that um, when you're teaching a class asynchronously, we'll get questions like, how do you do number 35? And then just kind of like, that's all you get, right? And so I will oftentimes make video responses to my students' emails, um, which will you know, address their questions and walk them through a question if, if uh, it's related to the content. Yeah, I, I guess I just want to add that I do that a little bit too. So in my weekly welcome videos and what makes them so much in real time is that I will often give general notes to things that I'm seeing um, in trends in the classroom or um, if somebody does ask me a really good question, I think all students would benefit from, then I'll sort of acknowledge that in my welcome video. So um, I guess I am doing a little bit of feedback in my weekly welcome videos as well. And I'll just say, I loved using Studio to give feedback to my students. Um, I felt that it, uh, especially I taught writing and communication and um, feedback on an essay can get overwhelming really quickly. So it helped me kind of focus and it also allowed me to set a tone. There's something about hearing you say it rather than having students read it. And especially since students, um, they want your feedback, but they the little internal voice maybe doesn't read it as nicely as you meant it. Um, we talked to a bunch of students who were talking about when faculty write interesting, and their interpretation of what that meant. And uh, of course, you know, when you write interesting on a student's paper, you're saying, wow, interesting, but they're reading interesting. And so if you're able to like say it to them instead of um, having them read it, then you can put a lot more uh, into it just in your intonation. Um, there were several questions about uh, when you should be using the editor. And as I noted in my very quick overview, um, when you record in studio using the studio recorder, you have one shot to edit it. And once you've uploaded it completely, that's it. You can't edit it again. If you're using an editor on your uh, desktop, such as Screencast-O-Matic or QuickTime or Camtasia or a host of other ones, you can edit as many times as you want. You upload it into studio the completed video. And then, um, so you want to trim it and everything else before you get it in to studio. Um, the first you time- You can pull videos out of studio and yes, edit you can. them too, yeah. Yeah, I've so done once, it. <laughs> once you upload them to studio, you have a one shot um, to edit it. And then otherwise you have to download it if you want to edit it again, right? Which is why I always try to save um, my video files your computer can get filled up with files really, really quickly. And so having a backup hard drive where you keep those videos is a really good idea. Um, someone else asked about how much memory you have for your studio videos, and that depends on your campus. It's individual by campus. Um, we did have a couple of people run out of um, video space and, and we made it bigger at um, Foothill. Um, but we also asked people to like, clean up, right? Clean every once in a while, get rid of some old videos. If you're not using them anymore, delete them. Um, another question was about the optimal length. And of course it depends on, on what you're doing, but if you want students to pay attention to a micro lesson, you probably want to keep it around five minutes. It's better to have multiple short videos than to have one long video. Michelle is taking out her gigantic hook and, and tugging at our necks. <laughs> oh, stop. You know, I would never do that to any of you. 
I am just sitting here reflecting on how much you all have shared in 90 minutes. And I know 90 minutes is a long time, but really, Lene isn't kidding. Like that was, that was like three different separate sessions packed into one, which is going to make this this recording so much more resourceful. And I know there's many people who already said they're going to come back and watch it again. And I just hope that everyone here, if you haven't done so yet, click your reactions button and give a big applause or a heart for our presenters, because I, the time and love and energy that went into this is phenomenal. So Thank you so much. And I also want to say, Cynthia, Rosa, and Nicole, it's clear that you have a very supportive dean who really cares about you and wants to be sure that you have the resources that you need to support your students as best you can. So, Lene, thank you so much for, for coming back to our to our team here. It was it was fun to, to kind of share the stage here with you a little bit, like, like old times. And um I think we'll wrap it up here since it's 4.30 and I hope everyone has a lovely rest of the afternoon and the evening. And go watch Cynthia's video. It's so good. And thank you for that course. I didn't even say that. That was, um, wow, what a gem. We're going to add the link to the course also on the website underneath the archives. So if, if anyone out there listening is afraid of losing it, go back to our going the distance webpage on the at one website and you can find the link there. Okay. Take care. Bye. Lene, would you mind posting the link to this archive in the course too, the canvas course? Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. I'll send you the link when it's available. Okay. 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 Great idea. Whoever suggested that. Yes. Kim, thanks. Okay. I'm going to really uh, wrap it up now. Bye. <laughs> Bye.